Let's have prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for a time to come and study your word. We offer a, a prayer for Randy Kincaid, what he has meant in this church and in this town, and what uh, support he and uh, Merrimack have given in this church. Uh, we ask your blessings on uh, Shirley and Torstreet. Uh, let her know that we are concerned and that she is loved by people in this church who know her well. And we just, our hearts bleed for the people in Ukraine who are going through such difficult times. And Lord, we just ask that you intervene there in some way to help these people in a desperate situation. Thank you for the teachers who prepare our lessons here and just bless us as we listen and try to gain some truth from this. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I was very pleased. I used the uh, These Days devotional and the devotional yesterday was just the way I thought, I'm going to share that with the class. And guess what? Peter Henry stole my Thunder. <laughs> he stole my thunder. I told him he did. He said, well, maybe some of them weren't there. <laughs> and what I'm talking about is Joseph. And uh, the same scripture, actually, Matthew uh, 1, 18 through 25. So let's, if you'll help me out a little bit, let's, let's talk a little bit about your impressions of Joseph and uh, how he handled things or how he should have had a plan. Well, start, go ahead. He was a vivid dreamer. And he uh, trusted what he learned and what was revealed to him. So I think I always parallel Moses with Joseph. That Moses could have walked away from that burning bush. Joseph could have woken up and said, boy, I've got indigestion, and counted it just as a weird dream. I think a little bit about, give us a little bit of your thoughts of what he, if he had walked away. Oh, well, then Mary. Said, I'm not going to do it by that hussy. She's been messing yeah, around. Yeah. <laughs> right. Southern. <laughs> yeah, things would have turned out differently for Mary. He could have been. He was the linchpin. That moment. I like the way that he followed the angel's uh, direction of name, says his name's Jesus. Sort of like Zachariah was about John. Right? Yeah, right. What occurred to me was, uh, was uh, the societal change we thought about this morning. Uh, and perhaps it was the patriarchal society at the time. So there was that, uh, that husband to be who knew the penalty or the social penalty of a pregnant woman who wasn't married. Now, I forgot, forgot the statistics, now it's nothing. It's, 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 it, maybe the majority of children born now, Van Lee would know that uh, percent, maybe the majority of children born now are to, to a single mother, but not at that time. So there was that, that uh, societal penalty for that woman for having that child without being married. Oh, she probably would have been stoned or something. I mean, that was what you're saying. Joseph had compassion, compassion. Yes. and he had faith. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Faith. He had a great deal of faith. Mm -hmm. Right. The word honorable is always a word I think about when I think of Joseph. He listened, but he was an honorable, caring uh, person who would do the right thing. And there was direction there, and he went along with divine direction as well. What do they think was his age? <laughs> I've always 20. pictured him as being an older man, but I, 
Probably not. They, Probably not. They, well, nobody lived much past 30. That's, that's what I was going to say. Is <laughs> the lifespan was not very long. I think there were children after Jesus, too. Well, that's, well we said James, the brother of Christ, we're, we're, but um, Catholics believe that she remained a virgin for the rest of her life, which I think is very far-fetched. But, that, but there's no scriptural. That's just there belief. But, um, I, I, you know, I think Protestants generally accept that there was a family, a whole family. My mind sort of wonders, but I, I would sort of think that Joseph was a pretty important person in Jesus' life because that's mm -hmm. where he went, learned his, uh, whatever vocational right. skills mm -hmm. he had. Well, we think that. Hmm. Anybody else want to well, it was a very patriarchal society anyway, so that I think that the father would have been. Yeah. And he clearly, and I'm sure he saw Joseph as his father. I just often wondered, you know, when did he pass away or how long did he pass away? I do too. Mm -hmm. Where, where was he when Jesus was crucified? What, what had happened? Nothing is mentioned. Never heard. And he was the descendant of David. <laughs> Oh, yes. I think at that time he was still trying to figure out what happened. There was no dialogue in the Bible about what you said. So wait a minute, what is going on? What's going on? No blame is a sign. Pretty interesting. What you said. What's going on? Well, I think there's those of us who would say that we, uh, we were pretty impressed by this man and, and his maturity and commitment, very great commitment. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sorry I didn't get to deliver my little sermon yet. <laughs> uh, thank you for uh, backing me mm -hmm. up and, and giving me your thoughts on this. Um, think about that a little bit during Christmas when we see the nativity and you think about think about Joseph. And Leah? Well, before she comes up, one, yes, one, 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 have a bit of a history quiz, a Presbyterian history, history quiz. Who, who remembers when Charlie Renell's grandfather was the minister of the First Presbyterian Church in Statesville? Who 1890s, Statesville had very progressive, had street lights, but nobody else had street lights. Who remembered Neil McGahey, who succeeded Charlie Renell in the 30s? Well, I don't, but I mean, I know that they did. Yeah, so I'm raising my hand. <laughs> <laughs> who remembers Frances McGahey, Neil's wife, who was here as a resident of, of the Pines? <laughs> So, I, so I'll bring up Francis now. So here is just the irony of the of the, the Christmas joy offering this morning, and our ministers, the retired ministers, and their widows. So Francis would when we we used to be oriented that way. Sam would stand there, then Russell Van Leer was always in that distinctive mix. But Francis would sit right about here, and Francis goosed me maybe early December, and it was from her experience being the wife of a Presbyterian minister. And how those small gestures were so doggone meaningful to those ministers. I remember my, my uncle Bill was a minister in 50 years, and he said he made $4,000 a year during the Depression. And his church would have a hard time paying him. So I'm sure every single Presbyterian minister and those who've come through the process has, would have had those financial strains. So Francis was just, the thought was, and to me, was just how significant, a, just a tiny little gesture was to that, to that minister. So in that context, Francis whispered to me and said, when, when Sam was up there, Francis said, David, you need to do something for Sam at Christmas time. She said, you need, uh, I was just a bit puzzled. And she said, I'm gonna call you a Maloney elf. So in the context of, of those who preceded us, who, taught me so much and been so mean as each of you so meaningful to me. I want to be a little Maloney elf today 
And who can remember the? You all are just too young to remember canning. Who who remembers canning? Canning fruits and vegetables oh, from your farm. Oh, Does anybody oh, remember oh, that? Oh, yeah. So the Maloney elves <laughs> want to think about our distinctive teachers and Van Leer. It, it, it was not we who did the canning, so it, it's right. Oh, well, thank you. But some, some, some neat chow chow and stuff like oh, that. Oh, thank you so much. Gus, we appreciate your taking on that role as well. We want to have something for you and your family to celebrate thank Christmas you. with. Oh, and, and, really are, it really is canned stuff. Yeah. In the spirit of Francis yeah. McGahey, in the spirit of those yeah. men and women yeah. who yeah. Yeah. see you. Yeah. How nice, thank you. Wonderful, wonderful from Ashley Farmers Market, Mr. Elf. Maloney Elf. Maloney Elf. There was one level of of pay that was lower than a pastor, and that was a, a college professor. How did that say? Yeah. yeah. And things have caught up on, on yeah. both scores, but there was right. a time when no, the pastors <laughs> were paid more than the college professors. Yeah. Well, let us return from the third Sunday with John the Baptist, and um, I want you, we are we are looking at John as he is portrayed in Luke, and I want you to remember it's very important that Luke is writing to a Gentile population to Gentiles, and Luke is. Luke is conveying a message that Jesus, although a Jew and a, and, a, and a devout Jew, Jesus is the savior of the entire world, that he has come for all mankind, not just for, for the Jews. Now, last week we talked about this feeling of anticipation that was kind of gripping Palestine right at this time. Um, this feeling that there was going to become a, a Messiah, a deliverer. They've not been a true nation for, since, the, since the exile. Um, they've never regained their political and uh, international status that they had prior to the fall of, of Jerusalem, prior to the fall of Judah to the, to the Babylonian. They've been conquered by one foreign power after another, the Persians, the Greeks under Alexander the Great, then they were ruled by the Seleucids, who were, they were uh, one of Alexander's generals, and then the Romans, and now the Romans. They are not, they are a small, Palestine is a small, a little backwater part of the Roman Empire. It's not very, it's important because it's a crossroads, but it's not, um, it's nowhere near what other places like Damascus or Antioch are, and you know, but they they are. There is this belief that is was apparently just common that there was going to come a deliverance. There was going to come someone, a Messiah. Now it, it depended on who you talked to as to what that Messiah was going to look like. Um, some people thought it would be a political. Um, military leader from the house of David. By this time, David has assumed just uh, myst almost mystical uh, dimension in the, in the mind of the Palestinians. It's better, actually, David is one of those people It's maybe better that you don't look too closely at, at him. Um, he does better from afar than he does close up. And But there was another group of people who would have said that, no, this is going to be a a, 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 a someone sent from God, someone who will be um, a, a, a true religious Messiah. And into this, and it's also important to remember, <coughs> at this point, how did God use to speak to his people? There were prophets. Um, throughout the history of the Jewish people, there were prophets but prophesying has gone out of style or gone away for about 400 years. There hasn't been any real, any prophecy. And uh, into, this, into this very, it's a very dramatic atmosphere. It's an atmosphere that people are waiting, almost waiting. There's a good deal of tension. There's expectation. 
Now, not with everybody. There, some people were very happy under Roman rule, um, and there were reasons to be happy under the Romans. You had, um, for one thing, you had peace. Um, the Pax Romana was one of the great times. In fact, um, uh, I'm not sure about what that was, and if I could have picked any time to live just for just being feeling secure in my own bed, maybe that would have been the time to do it. Um, you, you lived fairly comfortably. Um, the Romans had a very high standard of living, and that pervade, that went through the whole empire. Winston Churchill, in his History of the English-Speaking Peoples, which he wrote in the 50s, says that the most comfortable time to live in England ever was when the Romans were there. And he says, we're just beginning to get back to that level of comfort. Now, he was writing in the 1950s, and I can tell you right now, England wasn't that comfortable in the 1950s, but um, they had, the Romans had things like central heating and running water. And I mean, there was a high standard of living. So not everyone, and then we, last week, we also talked about the transportation, that you could travel safely from one end of the Roman Empire to the other by land or by sea because they had completely, they had the system of highways, they had made the oceans, was, the Mediterranean Sea was now a Roman lake. It was a safe place to live. And so not everyone in Palestine was unhappy living under Rome. I think probably the wealthier you were, the happier you were. Um, but there was still this, this kind of tension and into the middle of this comes a man named John the Baptist. Um, now Luke, remember, is his writing most excellent. Theophilus to Theophilus, who is maybe a person, or maybe he's using Theophilus to represent a group of people. But he is said in the preface, in his beginning of his book, you have been instructed You've, learned, you've been taught the things that happened. I want to show you the, the truth of these things. And so Luke is always grounding us in history. Luke is always telling us kind of when. He's, he's tying these events to, to what's going on in the outside world. In the 15th year of the reign of the Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, the ruler of Eritrea, and never mind because I can't pronounce it, um, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caliphas, the word, now he's being very precise here, in the 15th year of the reign of the Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was the governor of, of Galilee, and he even brings it down to who was the high priest in Jerusalem, the word of the God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And we've talked about that John really probably was raised away from his parents. Um, there are those who think he was an Essene um, at Qumran. Um, the Essenes are not mentioned in the Bible, but they are historically verifiable. And they were probably um, a sort of monastic organization of men who lived together in a community and shared everything they had with each other. And John very possibly was, was one of these people, and they lived apart. They lived apart from, well, from society. And John appears, and remember we talked about that he comes out of the wilderness, and he must have been a wild-looking person. Um, you know, he was wearing skins and living on honey and locusts. I, that, I just cannot get over that. Um, and, um, and he arrives, and he, it's like he sets a fire in Palestine. Um, he, he is, and he starts preaching. Um, John went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the, give, for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. 
Now, what what he is saying, in effect, in the first place, you, you think of him as being in the wilderness. And in reality, he was preaching close enough to the population centers so that people could flock out of them and come to hear him. And apparently they came in their hundreds and thousands. He was, he was quite the, the figure. Um, he was well known. He, he word went around. He did that there was this big preacher. It must have been kind of like a Billy Graham crusade. Um, and he um, and he is in effect saying, and remember now again, Luke is a Gentile. Luke is writing to Gentiles. Jesus, he's will accept him. The Messiah who is coming is the Messiah of the whole world. So that when John is preaching, he says, in effect, John says, you are children of Abraham, but that that alone is not going to, to get you where you need to be. It is not enough to be a circum, circumcised child of Abraham. You must admit your sins, open your heart, and truly repent and ask the Lord for forgiveness. Now that's that's a step further. You brood of vipers. That's a step further than um, where John would, would have us go. So he says, we have a, do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the ax is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what then should we do? And then, and now he begins to talk about how you should live your life. In reply, he said to them, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. You must share. You must live a life of charitable giving. You must share with those who don't have. You must be generous. You must be concerned for your fellow person. It is not enough to be a circumcised child of Abraham. You must live a life of repentance. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. John was baptizing, but he was he the baptism was more of a, a way of showing that you are dedicating your life to this new idea and you're 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 opening your life to repentance. Even bat, tax collectors came to be baptized. And remember, tax collectors were they were socially just non-existent. <laughs> um, they were hated because they were tax they were collecting taxes for Rome. Um, they were seen as traitors. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. In other words, continue to collect taxes. That's your job, but don't cheat anyone. Soldiers came to him and said, And what should we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation and be satisfied with your wages. How often they heard that before? Um, uh, apparent, Roman soldiers were fairly um, ruthless. And the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah. Is this the one we've been waiting for? And it says much for John and his understanding of his mission that he very quickly says, no, no. There is one coming after me who is mightier than I am. I would not be worthy of untying his sandals. And the one who is coming will be the savior of the world. John doesn't try, John does not in any way try to take advantage of this really rather important position that he's assumed. I think we forget, or we don't fully understand, um, what a figure he was, briefly, in, in Palestine. He was known throughout Palestine, and people flocked to hear him. 
And he could have said, yes, I'm the Messiah, sure. And they would have believed him, but he didn't. He, he was on his own mission from God. And so that when Jesus comes, finally, to John, he comes out to John. And John baptizes him, which is the great moment of John's life. Um, it, 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 is, uh, it is kind of also the, the, the culmination of his ministry. And then that is when the famous, when Jesus, probably only Jesus heard God say, thou art my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. John does not have a happy ending. Like Jesus, he is executed. Um, he is, he is, John, no one is spared from John's very highly moralistic view of the world. And he is particularly credit, critical of Herod. Um, Herod is the son of the of Herod the Great. Um, Herod the Great, they, my maps have never come back, have they? They were um, uh, they were sort of not seen as real Jews, but Herod the Great tried very hard to ingratiate himself into the hearts uh, of the of the people of Palestine. He is the one who built the last temple. Um, the one that the Romans will destroy in, in 70 AD. Um, I mean, he takes the temple that's existing and, and really enlarges it and, and makes it very fancy. And he's the one who really built up Jerusalem, which had uh, really tried to turn Jerusalem back into what it was when David was king. Um, Herod also, um, he, he did, he really tried very hard to um, win the hearts of the people of Palestine. His son is more uh, ruthless, and his son had an unfortunate marriage. And I, I forgot to look it up. If I, if I remember correctly, he married his brother's wife. Is that? Right. right. Yeah. He, and so John is tally, accusing him, really, of, of sodomy and adultery and all kinds of things. And this is very irritating to, the son, to Herod, the son. And he has John arrested. And... Um, Legend, of course, you all know the legend that um, the, the story that uh, um, his uh, his wife wants his head on a, wants the head of John the Baptist on a silver platter, and at any rate, John is is eventually is executed uh, by Herod. Uh, but so it's he he and he probably knew when he went when he took when he went out on the the Hallelujah Trail, when he went out to do this preaching and that this was probably going to be the end, that he would he was going to displease somebody in power. He had no hesitation about uh, what he said and who he said it to and about whom. And he was going to step on somebody's foot. And unfortunately, he was Herod that he really offended. And Herod and his wife took care of him. So John is... Is his, he has served his purpose. He is the herald, the prophet, the one who has paved the way for Jesus. And now on this last Sunday of Advent, as we are waiting for Jesus, we should remember John a little bit more than sometimes we do um, because he won't be part of the rest of Luke. He won't be part of the shepherds and, and the manger and and uh, and and, the, and Jesus in the temple and the rest of he's, his his moment is over. But he did come out of the wilderness and he did prepare the way for the Messiah to come. And today we are waiting. We have one more week, and the Messiah will come. I want to read an Advent hymn. Lift up your heads, ye mighty gates. Behold, the King of glory waits. The King of kings is drawing near. The Savior of the world is here. Fling wide the portals of your heart. Make it a temple set apart, from, set apart from earthly use for heaven's employ. Adorned with prayer and love and joy. Redeemer, come, 
I open wide my heart to thee, here, Lord, abide. Let me thy inner presence feel, thy grace and love in me reveal. Can't you just hear John saying that? Redeemer, come, I open wide my heart to thee, here, Lord, abide. Let me thy inner presence feel, thy grace and love in me reveal. Amen. A couple of things. One is, uh, I've never had anything to indicate this. Uh, John was, uh, my, uh, Ken was a second cousin to Jesus. Mm -hmm. If you Mary and Elizabeth were cousins, yeah. I think of Sam. Yeah. Now, is there any indication that John and Jesus crossed paths until the that baptism? I Probably about thirty years. That's that's hard to believe. Well, but you know, it's it, it's interesting because when Elizabeth was pregnant, um, Mary heard about it and came to visit her. Mm -hmm. We know that. So it's 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 not out of it's not out of reason to think that at times the, the families visited. We did, but Stayed there's for two months. But, you know, maybe <laughs> maybe John went up and spent summers in Nazareth. I don't. You know, I don't know. The other thing is, uh, what's your view on the thing of where uh, John's in jail? And there's apparently some doubt. He sends is this, word. Is this, is this the Messiah? Are you the one that's yeah, promised? He sends Jesus that. Doesn't yeah. sound like a guy that's been preaching about Jesus. Well, I, I, we're I, not told. I there's no elaboration about that, mm -hmm. you know, except that John wants to be darn sure. Um, but. I, you know, I you think about it. If this is your second cousin, and all of a sudden you've grown up with him, and all of a sudden, and you're preaching that the Messiah is coming, and all of a sudden he appears, and it's your second cousin, you might want to be darn sure. I mean, I have some peculiar cousins. <laughs> <laughs> Well, John is sure it's the disciple. It's the, well, it's the disciple. That's right. It's yeah, the disciple. Good question, John, on that. Yeah. And I think that they were in a state of ultimate confusion. Well, and when John was arrested, um, I, I think we it, it was very shocking and terrifying to a lot of people because they thought of him as they thought of him as the Messiah, and or I even though he said he, he wasn't. I suspect he knew about what was going to happen. Oh, of course he did. And he wouldn't have been arrested. I think I John had a very when John went out first appears in pre, he he knows he's signing his own death warrant. I'm I mean, sure he does. This is not just a little. Slap on the wrist, kind of right. But I think that Jesus also knew what was going to happen to him, too. Any other comments or questions? When, when John was baptizing, Jesus was baptizing, and so were the disciples. The people came to John and they said, He's baptizing more people than you. And John said, But I baptize with water. The one that comes after me baptizes with the Spirit. And I think that would work. He never tried to claim uh, any, he never took advantage of the authority and the, and the power, the potential power that he had. He knew his mission. He knew his mission. Who was he calling a brood of vipers? I think the the, I think he was talking to the to the whole mass, the whole mass. because what because what Luke clearly has him saying is and, and this is because Luke is writing to Gentiles I'm pretty sure you think you're special because you're children of Abraham right. but you're not that's not gonna that's not gonna win it in, in the final analysis you need we all need to do the same thing and that is open our hearts and repent. I've always thought that, and, and the text doesn't really distinguish it, but I always thought that that um, reference was to, where it was to aimed at the uh, Jewish leaders who came out. It could have been, um, but it doesn't. But, but the everyday person no. felt uh, maybe excluded. It says he from says him. to the crowd that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers. Yeah, yeah. In the Old Testament, didn't Isaiah... Speak to the crowd and say, you know, you sinners, and, and call them names just to say, I don't know. <laughs> I'd have to check. Um, but I do want to. So, with many exhortations, he performed, he proclaimed the good news to the people. 
But Herod, the ruler, who had been rebuked by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the evil things that Herod had done, added to them all by shutting up John in prison. And that's... But Luke, this is, this is Luke writing to Gentiles, and he is in effect saying, Jesus is our Messiah. He is the Messiah of the world. Open your hearts, admit you are a sinner, repent, and live the life that Jesus, that John is describing, which is the life that Jesus wants you to live. So easy to do, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> You're not supposed to hear that. <laughs> um, so it is. It is Christmas time. It is a time of joy and light. And it's Luke, remember, who gives us the shepherds. He gives us the manger. He gives us. Um, it's Matthew who gives us the wise men. Um, but they're writing to two different audiences. But I think when we read Luke, <clears throat> it's important to remember that he. His audience is universal, and he will he will um, emphasize poorer people, such as the shepherds, which was a very marginal existence in those days. Um, he will emphasize women. He puts more emphasis on the importance of women than other gospel writers do. And he gives you an idea of the poverty that Jesus grew up in. Um, uh, for instance, he tells us that this is an aside, but uh, when they come to the temple, they, they bring a turtle dove uh, as a sacrifice. If they were wealthy people, they'd have brought a lamb. So let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, as we enter this final week of joyful anticipation, be with us. Help us to open our hearts to receive your Son, the Savior, the greatest gift that you have ever given anyone. He is there, and he wants so badly, he wants so badly to be received by us as he needs to be received, with hearts full of repentance and love for our fellow human beings. Heavenly Father, in this broken and turbulent world where things seem dark and hopeless sometimes, help us to open our eyes to see your light and the gift that you have so generously bestowed upon us. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>